to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. Realistically, this is hour one of Patriots Lament. For the next couple of hours, we're going to be talking about liberty, perhaps a little bit about what the Founding Fathers may have intended in for our country and the framework that they established. But even going beyond that, going prior to that, an awful lot of the stuff we've been talking about lately has to do with the philosophical groundwork that was laid in the hundreds of years prior to the American Revolution. I'm Steve Floyd. I'm the man with the face made for radio here. More to push buttons than anything else. The actual... Yeah, you've already pushed mine. Oh, good. You know, joining, me I don't the... even know. <laughs> <laughs> joining me in the studio from Big Horn Enterprises is uh, Josh Bennett, and I believe we've got Aaron Bennett somewhere on the way from Florida North Tactical. So, good morning, Josh. The FBI informant himself will be here. Oh, oh really? Which one? <laughs> this town is full of FBI. If I, if I believed every rumor that I've heard about who's an FBI informant, I, I really think that even I am an FBI informant from all the rumors I've heard. I just, it's crazy. Yeah, I, oh. you were just telling me some stuff is going on. I, need, I don't have Facebook, so I don't know what my brother does on there unless he informs me. I haven't been listening to, I've been super busy bidding on some work because I'm a capital, capitalist. <laughs> You're like, capitalist, capitalist. Capitalist swine. Yes. So I've. Basically had to lock the office door and button down and and just work, which really stinks sometimes, especially every day. Good night. Anyway, so I haven't been listening to the radio and you're telling me some of this stuff. It just makes me laugh. I mean, uh, I wish people would just call us out on the radio instead of their own shows or whatever. I mean, we're open to uh, criticism, I believe. We always have been. We don't shun it. We never say that we're the only correct. We are, but <laughs> we never say it that we're the only correct. You just did version of thought. We just have a personal opinions, and well, it, well, we the, enjoy people challenging those opinions. One of the things that I enjoy about the way that you have challenged my opinions over the last couple of years it has been that you refer me to actual books and thinkers who have written out these positions literally hundreds of years ago and i i find myself saying well why haven't i heard of this guy i or i've heard this name why have i never read this piece of literature before and i think what it comes down to is uh the dumbing down of america and I, i'm a product of this public school systems so i went through uh well the full k through 12 but then i also went back and I did another Give me more. Five, five and a half years to get my four-year degree, right? And then I also spent some time in the U.S. Army. So, I mean, I am I am fully indoctrinated into the ways of the state, or at least I was when when you and I started talking when you were running for office back in mm-hmm. 2010. And, uh, man, you have really helped me formulate my thoughts more clearly because there are an awful lot of things that I hear conservatives hold on to that are really they're nothing more than shadows of the original ideas yeah well and we don't need to go into this but really if you look at the conservative movement of today they're old trotskyites from the left that were upset over vietnam and this and that whatever they were actually pro-war but they were leftists that moved to the conservative movement i mean we should do a show on that sometime to let conservative know who their leaders are. The Bill Crystals and the, uh, what was his, uh, I just can't think of all their names right now. But the, the, the leadership movement, especially in the, the thought of conservatism, um, I can't, oh well, well. Anyways, but you know, they were with the CIA, but they were old, all of them were old leftists that had moved on into the right and taking over that party. And that's conservatism of today. And when people get on us about this and that, none of, we've never, I've never told you that any idea I've talked to you about has ever been my personal thought out, I made this up. <laughs> Every idea that I've had comes from, like you said, the past. I read books and I formulated my opinions based on what other people have written for hundreds of years. Nothing new. So if people want to... Some would say there's really nothing new under the sun, John. You know, someone said that several thousand years ago. A long time ago, yeah. Someone accused him of being the smartest man in the world. (laughs) The wisest man in the world. So, I don't understand. People want to challenge our non-voting, our whatever. Just call us out on it. 
on the radio. You know, and you know what I would Our like, radio. You, on this show right <laughs> yeah. here, what I, what I would really appreciate, Josh, is if they've got a criticism, that, that they would present some evidence, maybe some new information, perhaps even a, a reason why they believe we're wrong, instead of simply sniping. Because the the most effective way to destroy your own argument, in my opinion, is to not address the argument of others, but simply mock them right? or snipe at them and make stuff up or repeat rumors that you've heard, and, and which, you know, it's ad hominem attacks. You attack, you, you go the attack against the man instead of an attack on the argument. In, in my opinion, you might be able to sway the stupid sheep out there, but there are more and more people are waking up. And, and if you resort to ad hominem attacks... I believe it shows the shallowness of your own thought process, and it shows the emptiness of your your soul. Yeah, I it, think the mocking should come after you destroy the argument. Then you mock them. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of mocking, I'm, I'm, I'm passing a couple articles to you. I don't know if you want to talk about any of the recent arrests that have uh, happened around town. No, I or, I, or if you want to talk about this one here, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the transfer of the F-16s. You know, we keep hearing this oh, politi- the <laughs> political game that keeps getting played as if somehow we, the people in the Fairbanks area, can <clears throat> force the United States military to keep their airplanes here. If enough of us make a public comment or if we get the political will out there, if we can get our, I mean, our, our congressional delegation has already made it very clear that they do not want the jets moved. I, and it's like, I'm, I'm, I find myself asking the question, so at what point, Senator Begich, at what point, Senator Murkowski, at what point, Congressman Don Young, did you ever serve in the military? What I love is the uh, social and uh, fiscal conservatives that demand that the Jets stay here. Well, should not, if they say that moving these things is going to save money. I mean, aren't we all trying to get the government to... Be smaller and spend less, or that except for the military. Even if it didn't save money, what I would want, where I want military hardware stationed, where I want military people stationed, is where it makes the most sense strategically. Well, how far away are we from the coast right here, Josh, in the interior of Alaska? Uh, Any direction. See, I can drive to Prudhoe. It takes about it's about 500 miles, 510 by road. And, and if you go down so to it's Anchorage, 400 by the. Yeah, so I mean, we're about 400 miles away from the borders mm-hmm. in any direction here in Fairbanks. So basically, in order for our Air Force in Fairbanks to respond to a threat in the sky, they'd have to pretty much already be in our airspace. <laughs> Does that make a lot of sense to anybody? Why wouldn't we want the jets stationed closer to the coast? Yeah. Why why wouldn't we want the jets stationed closer to the border? It doesn't have anything to do with anything except for the fact they're afraid if they leave, the North Pole will collapse. Because they well, live in a false why economy. Does, exactly. Why does North Pole exist in the first place? It's because of the military base. Yeah. And, and some would argue that even Fairbanks. Oh, it hurt. It would hurt. Well, the economy here really is a false economy. There is no economic engine driving it. The, the economy that stayed would probably end up doing quite well without the uh, first of all your housing would go down mm-hmm. land would be cheaper more people could purchase there would be fewer people here to purchase the land it would, you'd have to require a, a major restructuring of the borough because they would not be able to afford <laughs> the level of government that we've been paying for we'd have to basically eliminate them I guess <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a drawback here I'm not seeing any <laughs> I, I I guess you know and, and I know they, like you said there are conservatives they're just bent out of, or so people who call themselves conservatives bent out of shape at the very thought that you would suggest that it, it's okay if I, if not only if the F-16s leave, but if the entire base closed down. Oh my goodness! Good riddance. It makes it makes their eyes bleed. And then I and then I ask myself the question: Well, if you call yourself a conservative, what does that really mean? Does it mean that you support the military? Does it mean that you support today's conservatism? Yeah. Means you support war, nonstop war of aggression, empire. It means that you absolutely are against everything that the founding fathers of this nation stood for. That is today's conservative party. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one more article at you, and then uh, if you'd like to, maybe we could go to the phones here. I don't know oh, if you gosh. heard about the, the, speaking of the military, there was a, the jets got scrambled Thursday night uh, out of Oregon, actually, because the FBI had had a threat called into them of a potential hijacker on board a, an Alaska Airlines flight going from Honolulu to Seattle. So, and, you know, the, the knee-jerk response is, well, we're going to have to go shoot that plane down. So they sent up F-16s to trail... And uh, and shadow that. How would you feel if you were on an airplane and you looked out the window and you see a couple of military jets just kind of hovering around outside? And mm. you you know we we excoriated the Soviet Union back in 1980. What was it? 84, 86. I forget exactly when they shot down that civilian airliner out of South Korea. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah we I absolutely. I, I mean, young. we tore them up because oh, how could you go and shoot down a civilian jet? Well, they were under the impression that it was a threat. And and what are we doing? We're scrambling our jets and sending them up there alongside these civilian airliners because somebody called in that there was a hijacker on board. They didn't hear from the airplane. Oh, we got a hijacker. Oh, it was FBI, too. They, they got a tip. So when they landed at SeaTac, they yanked this guy off the flight. He's like, uh, what? They interviewed him for two hours. They described him as cooperative. I don't think have they identified his name yet. I don't no, think they've identified him publicly. But they did say he was cooperative with them. And after the two-hour interview, they finally decided, nope, that was a hoax phone call. <laughs> Probably from my informant brother. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, now how does that make you feel? If if somebody could just call in a tip. Well, yeah, you're supposed and, to and, see something, say oh, something. Ah, there you go. At, and, and so they, and so the, and, and again, everyone it, is an FBI informant. And who's behind that? Are, are, the I FBI. Mean, no, no, no. I don't mean, I don't mean who's who's prompting it, but who would support that? Don't you hear conservatives support? <laughs> oh yeah. Law enforcement. Going. Yeah. You hear these so-called conservatives. Well, we we need to be able to get the bad guys off the streets, even before they've done anything wrong. The conservatives are the ones that gave us the indefinite detention acts of the national defense authorization act well and well plus the patriot act the i mean conservatives who, gave us the patriot act. john mccain didn't he have an awful lot to do with that one yeah. i mean he's had an awful lot to do with both of those he wrote the indefinite detention act and lindsey graham mm-hmm. frothed at the mouth defending it yeah they're jokes i can't stand them can't stand any of them, actually. My brother and I were talking about this, uh, the gun situation, you know, and uh, he had a pretty interesting theory that made me think of uh, Richard Mayberry. We were talking the uh, executive orders that President Obama passed or signed in or whatever, and most of them were pretty blah, whatever. And uh, one of them was an importation ban, which I thought was interesting. And then Aaron said, you know, we always say you can't take whatever the state does at face value. There's usually an undercurrent. There's something behind the scenes that's really going on. And uh, Aaron had the thought, well, what if the gun manufacturers themselves had been lobbying for some of this stuff? Because uh, I think he was saying that Century Arms imports and sells 10 to 1. Um, domestic firearms. I think he said 10 to 1, something like that. But they're a foreign... They import, right? They import foreign weapons, foreign designs and stuff. So they, he was basically saying that perhaps our own... America's own gun manufacturers are behind some of this stuff to get a little bit more monopoly going, which I thought was pretty interesting because remember when we talked to Richard Mayberry, he said... We asked him about the ammo purchase from DHS... <coughs> And he said, well, they, they might have bad intentions, or the people that sold the ammunition might have really good lobbyists. Yep. And there's always there's always that, that we never, we always see things up front and say, oh, face value is what the government is always doing. They're always lying. So who knows what's behind that for real? It's pretty interesting. And I saw a bunch of blogs where people are congratulating the gun owners for putting up, you know, making the stand. They were on a war footing because of the gun ban. I read that 10 million guns were sold last month. Over 100,000 people joined the NRA in the week. The week. The week, yeah. That President Obama announced his uh, 
his new gun control measures. Was that just last week? Yeah, it was. So within the week, 100,000 people joined the NRA. Yeah. So we see... And, and, and what, those memberships are all free, right? I believe. Or no, they oh, pay. Oh, they do. Yeah, you pay to be yeah. a member of the NRA. Yeah. So I'm reading these blogs, and everyone's, you know, who on, kind of tooting their horn because they know they're not going to get a gun. No gun measures are going to actually pass. I don't think everyone doesn't. No one thinks it will. I mean, even Congress is saying, "Yeah, good luck." Well, and even even the executive orders that were issued. I mean, if you look at any one of them, they're pretty bland. They're they're bland. I mean, they they are, they go no farther than anything that George W. Bush ever did. Right. They're, so, so they got like I said, these blogs are saying congratulations, and you know, listen to the radio, and people are going. Darn right, we stood up, we made our voices known, we're going to keep our guns, and blah, blah, blah. And we basically, Aaron and I were talking about that too. So, good job, you kept your guns. But you will still pay every tax mm-hmm. the government tells mm-hmm. you to pay without question. You'll still obey every law. You'll still obey every regulation. You'll still buy every little stamp tax that they tell you to buy, which is, you know, every little permit, your business license, whatever it is. You'll still follow Obamacare. Obama still has a kill list. We still have National Defense Authorization Acts, which have indefinite detention in there. We still have the Fourth Amendment getting crushed. We still have the Patriot Act. So, but we still have, we got our guns. We stood up and said, you shall not take our guns. But what do they care? I mean, do we really think that they would chance a armed rebellion by taking our guns? They got us all worked up. They don't care. We still bow our knee to every little edict that the emperor gives. And not just the emperor, we bow our knee to every little... You know, the little petty thieves across the water here the, at the, the borough. The assembly. mini emperor. I mean, look at all the so called czars they get. Right. They, well, and, that and aren't who, even elected. Well, and didn't Ronald Reagan start that? <laughs> I mean, people talk about Ronald Reagan as this bastion of conservatism. Well, he only raised taxes six times, Steve. No, I mean, he would, what, they would have raised it seven or eight times if it hadn't. I, I, right. Well, they're talking about he cut taxes first, very first he cut taxes, but then they always. Forget the fact that he raised them six times afterwards. But he took such a stand for liberty when he stood there and, and the said, Mr. Gorbachev, <sighs> tear down this wall. Yeah, what a stand. <laughs> They're tearing them down over there and building them over here. Well, and if I remember correctly, didn't the, the bombing of Libya, 19, well, that was 86, 86, right? Yeah. That was in response to a criminal who killed a couple of Americans in Berlin. And, of course, because they made a link to Mornar Gaddafi because of some of the things he said, mm-hmm. we bombed him. Killed his two-year-old daughter. Yeah. <laughs> now, if somebody bombed your house and killed one of your daughters, Josh, you they, would, you'd would you be happy about that, yeah, right? You, you they, would just say, you know what? I really understand. I said some things I shouldn't have said. And, they're correct. And I had it coming. Yeah. No, you, no. Wouldn't, you wouldn't say that. No. You, you would... You would de- Decide in your mind that you were going to fight. I would declare war on yeah. that person. Yeah. So Ronald Reagan, when he bombed Libya in response to a terrorist. Well, and and that's the thing is that what the link between the terrorists and the disco bombing in Berlin and Muammar Gaddafi, even if he had sent them personally to go and do the bidding. Is it ever justified for us to go and bomb a country? Because you know what? It was the conservatives who stood up and and were like, yay, wave the flag. It's the conservatives who bemoan, actually it's all Americans that bemoan the shooting in uh, Connecticut a couple, well, a month now. We're so sad about that, rightfully so, terrible thing. But at the same time, we have no problem with Barack Obama Daily signing kill hit, kill orders. Daily killing kids. They kill kids every single day in the Middle East. We have no problem when, uh, what what was it? <clears throat> it was in the news not too long ago. Those three little kids, the oldest one was 10. They're like 10, 8, and 6 out gathering poop for the fire, which is what they did every morning. And they got hit with a drone. <clears throat> 
Still, just the three little kids. There's no one around them or anything. They got hit, and then the, the military was questioned about it. And they said, well, you know, we see a lot of these kids as these days are threats. They were threats. Threats to their drone. While they were out there, no weapons, no other person around them. Three little kids under the age they of might 10. Have, they might have been planting a bomb. John. They might have been planting a bomb. But they were picking up goat, not goat, they were picking up cow poop to take back to their parents for fuel, for their fire. That's how these people live. We're so threatened by these people that are still using cow poop to heat their homes and to cook for fuel. I wonder what the emissions for on that is. Cooking. Oh, because you know what? That might be right. We're bombing know, them. Well, you know what? Endangering they, the earth exactly. with their... Exactly. They, they're probably huh. putting out way too much PM 2.5 out of that cow poop. But we have no problem with it. That's the threat, right? They there. kill what? That one uh, wedding, they killed 153 people because they had a target there? And 23 or 53 or 50 of them were little kids? We have no problem doing that all over the world. We don't understand why they get mad at us. Well, and this is one of the things that got Ron Paul in such a bad light with the conservatives is because he suggested that we were creating terrorists by bombing <laughs> wedding parties and children, that that we, I mean, the United States, was feeding the flam, the flames of terrorism by doing these strikes. Yeah. And that, that just, that really ticks off people who call themselves conservative. Because, again, what does conservative mean? That you're not a liberal? <laughs> that it, well, and what does liberal mean? I mean, why do you have to have a label for everybody? And and y- y- okay, the founding fathers considered themselves liberals. Exactly, but the founding fathers also gave us a very strict and a very clairvoyant kind of warning about party politics. Hmm. What did they say about it? Are you looking up a quote? No, I, mean, I it's, just it's, I believe someone's it's buzzing me. I had to make sure it wasn't work related. <laughs> No, the uh, party politics was, I don't know exactly what, I can't word for word them, but they were very much against it. Washington, as Farewell Address said, no. Because what happens, basically what they said was what happens is all you do is you forget the people, and then all you worry about is your parties, and then the parties fight, 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 and they divide the people into factions instead of fighting for... Their liberties, they fight for their parties. Which, well, why do they call them a party, anyways? <laughs> they're not very fun, are they? No. Uh, it, if you think about, too, the difference between standing up for one another versus pointing your finger at one another, this is the same kind of thing. I mentioned it in the last what, like two weeks ago, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, mm-hmm. when he was actually in the gulag. Bemoaning the fact that Bemoaning, didn't stand exactly. For if each other. if we had only stood up for each other instead of hiding in our apartments, glad that it wasn't us being arrested. If we had instead banded together and set an ambush for these people when they came to haul, haul off even one. Well, and we did it with the guns, the same thing. We kinda of stood mm-hmm. up for that, but big deal. What do they care if you have if you're armed? I think they would much rather we were unarmed people. The state would much rather have that. That's that's the epitome of goodness. But we are so sheep. We don't need to be armed because we do every single thing that they tell us to do. George Washington in his farewell address, September 17th, 1796. However political parties may now and then answer popular ends, they are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. We don't have unprincipled men in Congress, do we? Mm. Yeah. (laughs) We directly do. All right, four or five. I shouldn't say that. Alaska directly does. Yeah, let's take the call. Well, we can't actually. We're up against the news already. Uh, if oh, you man. can believe that. We got the Fox News here at the bottom of the hour. If you're on hold, we got three lines waiting. We will come right back. And take your phone calls if you'd like to get on hold. We got one line open for you to fight over, and uh, we'll also open up the chat room at kfar660.com if you'd like to sound off there. Just keep in mind, we do not have a lifeguard on duty. 
So it's going to be kind of an open swim there on the chat room. Yeah, make sure that you have your floaties on because I'm not going to jump in there and rescue you if somebody says something you don't like. KFAR660.com and the World Wide Web. And some people have up and left. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you think about the, the very stuff that we've been talking about on this uh, radio program for the last year and a half and the idea that sometime it's eventually it's going to get so bad here that you're going to want to leave and you're not going to be able to because you're not going to be able to get a passport. You're not going to be able to leave because you're not going to have any money. They won't allow you to go. Well, even now, I mean, if you if you leave and or if you try to leave and they think you owe taxes, even if everything else is in order, they will prevent you from leaving. You Fifty will be... thousand bucks, I think. Hmm. Four five eight talk is the number. You've got it on the Saturday morning wake up call, which is technically hour one of Patriots Lament. Go and check out the phone calls. All right, Perfect. we have cleared it out. Wasn't ready for that. Woo. All right. Uh, you, you know, it, it, we're talking about being conservative and how so many so-called conservatives are just clamoring for more and more government and uh, fighting to keep Eielson open, uh, fighting not even to allow any of the jets to be moved around, which, I mean, if you think about the political interference in the military, if you've ever served in the military... You know what it's like to have an order come down that, A, A, makes absolutely no sense, and, B, completely countermands good strategy. It's happened again and again and again. Whenever politicians try to manage warfare, we lose. And, And I'm not saying that we should just get out of the way and let the generals go invade what they want to invade. I mean, there has to be oversight on the military. If there's not, then you end up with a nothing more than a military dictatorship. Yeah, because they like wars. They they justify their very existence by doing war games of where else they might invade just in case. However, I mean, you, you look at uh, the outcry over Eielson, and then you had the undersecretary of the Army was in the Fairbanks area just this last week. And he's speaking to reporters down there by Fort Greeley after going through all of the different stations around town. He was asked about the drawdowns and these automatic budget cuts, and he assured the people of Fairbanks that there would be no reduction in force in Alaska for the Army. I mean, he is undersecretary of the Army. He's not DOD. He can't talk about Air Force, but he can certainly talk about Army. Rest assured, we're going to have plenty of boots on the ground here in Alaska. And the reaction from the local politicians, from the governor from the mayors of Fairbanks and North Pole from the conser- the so-called conservatives it has been what critical are they are they worried about having federal troops garrisoned in our backyard no they welcome it i don't know i don't listen to them much i don't really care i don't listen to the army when they talk i don't listen to the mayors when they talk they're all a bunch of jokers in my mind if they want to talk, call this radio show, and we'll give them a run for their money. Oh, maybe that's one of them right there. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Uh, is this me? It might be. Depends on who it is. Uh, my name's Gerald. Gerald, it is you. Congratulations. What's on your mind? Uh, well, actually, uh, I'm a very independent leftist, and I find it very painful to listen to you guys sometimes because <clears throat> I'm very argumentative, and I think you've been pretty fair, and there's nothing for me to attack. So uh, I'd like to share this little poem I have. It's 12 lines. It's about advocacy fatigue, if I may. Go for it. Okay. Uh, The title of this poem is The Old Protester, and it goes, There was one cause which was not lost, a sign you could not see. I may not change the world, but it's not changing me. For the spirit never dies. They just bottle it in gin. There are wild butterflies. No one will ever pin a smile made just for hard eyes, a soft touch for thick skin, a virginity that dies just before the fun begins. (laughs) I like it. So you're you said you're a leftist? Yes, sir. Very independent. Well, that's good. I mean, we don't I mean, we don't uh, pick and choose like we're not necessarily political, I guess, because we don't care if you're on the left, on the right. It doesn't mean anything to us, really. We're just 
like you said about the uh, the protest, we're all about. I love protest. I love it when people protest together. We need to be protesting every day, and the left has been really good at that. And the right, well, every they, time they, the left, they were really good at it yeah, until Obama so took much, office. Right. I mean, what happened to the anti-war protest? Did we stop war? No. I mean, did, <laughs> no, did, did, did the war up. did the war end? Did we bring all the troops home? Yeah. Did we stop sending drones to kill children in other countries? Yeah, we want the left and the right to quit bickering and just fight the enemy, the state. Which is the state. Let yeah. me, um, caller, can I, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot your first name again. Gerald. Gerald. Okay, Gerald. Then I ask you a question. When you say you're a leftist, do you know where that term leftist comes from? Uh, I know what it means to me, but isn't it go back to, like, the left bank in uh, Paris? Yeah, actually, it does. It goes back to Paris, and it was it wasn't the left bank. It was the the left and right sides of the Parliament building, and both of them were statists. The left and the right, they were all statists. They were all they they nobody championed liberty, and the they were basically two sides of the same party. And well, when when people use the left and the right terminology, you often hear the leftists equated with communists and the rightists equated with fascists. But what is the underlying philosophy of fascism? Socialism. It's socialism. Are you uh, are you a communist? No, um, I'm I'm just very independent. Uh, well, why I don't why where does that equate with leftism? Well, because uh, I've spent. Uh, well, I, I disappeared for over 10 years. I lived out in the wilderness by myself and lived off the land in uh, very remote places along the Yukon River, mostly on the Yukon Delta. Oh, man, and that's a beautiful spot. Why'd you, come, why'd, you come, why'd you come back? Why'd you leave that? We were the state troopers. Okay, all right. Then. Enough said. So, uh, but other than that, I mean, I've been homeless for 20 years trying to make it on minimum wage. I spent four and a half years in prison. And social and economic justice are a very big deal for me. The question, the controversy about the redistribution, excuse me, the redistribution of, of wealth, to me begs the question: How is wealth being distributed initially? And to me, the single most impact, important factor in determining who gets what is not hard work or smarts, but but power. And um, I'm just just kind of like that. I'm really into social and economic justice, not as the uh, Democrats rape that concept because the illegal immigrant thing is just really a basic knife in the back of the uh, working poor in this country. Well, and the leftists now in Congress, I mean, they give, they were more than happy to bail out great big banks and the banks that couldn't fail, and the leftists in Congress were more than happy to dole out billions and billions, actually trillions of dollars to companies that they said couldn't fail. And you're right, they don't give a flying leap. About me. nothing. Yeah. About you. No, not about you. Not about me. Not about they anybody. Don't care Gerald, about anyone. Can I ask? Well, you? I'm sorry. Yeah, Gerald. Can but I ask I, you a question? When when you were out there on the Yukon River, how did you eat? Well, I got most of my calories from a long gun and a net. So nice. so you went out and you hunted, and Correct. you fished. How how were the fish distributed to you? Well, I just caught them for myself and uh, tried them. You know, and I had like. Uh, a, a dog with me all the time. Uh huh. How how was the meat from the from the animal that you hunted? How 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 was that distributed to you? Well, you either eat it or dry it or lose it, basically. But but I mean, did somebody come and give it to you? No. No, you went out and you you got it for yourself. Correct. Now, when you did that, were you distributing wealth or were you creating wealth? Well, see, uh, I I, I see where you're going, and I kind of disagree with that because I think. The redistribution of wealth that happens in our society. Uh, I, I mean, I characterize the Democrats as closet Republicans, and I'm not a Democrat. I'm an independent leftist. But I think that we're getting screwed so badly here on the bottom with how hard we got to work for a much, very, very tiny uh, amount of money. I mean, the way I see it from my perspective is that my place in your world is under your feet, subsidizing your decadent middle class standard. A living with my cheap labor, and as far as the concept of uh, the redistribution of wealth is concerned, that in the net, uh, to me, middle class Americans are a parasite, and the, the redistribution of wealth thing that does happen in our country, as corrupt as it is, works against that dynamic a little bit, in my opinion. So you'd like to see the redistribution of wealth aimed at you a little bit more? 
No, sir. I'd like to see an, a, a decent day's pay for a decent day's work. No, nah, there you go. All now right, that now, is good. I, I, I can, I can, I can support a decent day's uh, wage for a decent day's work. Absolutely. The the thing that really kills me is the the use of the terminology of distribution, because when you went out to fish, did you go out and get more fish than you needed? No. No, you got the fish only what you needed to eat, and maybe a little bit extra to dry for the future, right? I mean, you you. A lot, a lot to dry because that's the whole big right. thing. If you want to live off the land, summer right. is easy. Winter is a butt kicker. So if some, if somebody came up and <laughs> yeah. knocked on your door and said you have gone out and gotten more fish than you need, and they went and they tried to take some of that fish that you had already gathered and harvested, and went to try to give it to somebody else who hadn't worked, w- well, wouldn't that um, wouldn't that piss you off a little bit? No, it wouldn't because it couldn't happen because typically my door is like an old sleeping bag. So so um. I would need another analogy, please. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. How about this? Do you do you are you um do you read at all? Oh yeah, I, I, I I'm Enjoy a real reading? bookworm. If I uh, got you a book that would uh, have a very heavy, uh, let's say, libertarian theme, would you consider reading it? I think I could do uh, business with a libertarian, but um, like when I lived out in the wilderness. You know, I was like really into Carl Jung and Eric Fromm, but um, you know, I'm, I have a passing acquaintance with Voltaire and Schopenhauer and Spinoza. Uh, uh, Soren Kierkegaard was very uh, difficult to read, but I got a lot out of it. And uh, yeah, I, I'm open to that. And cool. Yeah, you're obviously uh, you, open-minded. No, no, no. You see, here's the problem. He's he's demonstrating the uh, propensity fool. for thinking for himself, and that right there is what's going to get him in trouble. And, you know, it gets any it gets anybody in trouble if you think for yourself without uh, towing the the party line, whatever party you say you belong to. Josh, how I, can I don't he belong to a party? Okay, perfect. This is even better. That's even better. Now, how, Josh, how are you going to get that book to him? I don't know. I can either drop a, leave it here at the studio, or I can leave it over at Far North Tactical. But the book I'd like you to just take a look at it. It's from uh, Murray Rothbard. It's uh, For a New Liberty, and I think uh, he answers a lot of the things <laughs> dead on what you're talking okay, about. I think, I, would, uh, I think you'd enjoy it. Okay. Um, I know where Far North Tactical is, but with a little pro quo, I'm working on a paper about what our society looks like from the perspective on the bottom. May I share that with you? Sure. Absolutely. We'd love to Absolutely. see it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'll well, have I'm that com- book there, and I'll have your name on it. You tell them your name, and... Give you the book and leave. Do a little, do a little leave trade. Video, you yeah. leave your paper, pick up the book. Read okay, my book well, and I'll read yours. It's going to take me a while to get up there. I kind of hole up in the winter. I'm camped out over by the airport right now. Okay. But uh, I'll get down there within a couple of weeks and, and at Far North Tactical. Yep. Yep. Okay, well, this is really cool. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Gerald. Thanks really so appreciate the bye. phone call. 458-TALK so is the number. You know, we don't have to change anybody's mind no. for for this show to be successful. Simply talking about it and being open to discussion without calling people names. Yeah, and I agree with some of the stuff he talks about, like redistribution. There is a redistribution of wealth. It's from the wealthy to the wealthier. Yeah. yeah. And from the middle class to the wealthier, from the poor to the wealthier. Which, it's incidentally, has been the, the way it's always been. Mm-hmm. That's what the state is always about. I mean, it's one of the warnings in ancient uh, wisdom literature. You get yourself a king, the king is going to go out and... Take your stuff, well, man. Free market has the answers for that. It four, really does. Four five eight talk the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah, this is Carl. Carl, what's on your hey, mind, Carl, man? How's it going? Well, um, I was going to um, steer the conversation to the politics of toilet paper. If you're, I mean, and and I wish we could ask. That gentleman, uh, what does he use for toilet paper? I know I hear newspaper. Use newspaper. Because if you're in a position like him, it sounds like if you don't have any money, you rely on the local charities or the state. Well, the state's not going to help you unless you're applying for Social Security and you're going to die in six months, then the state will help you. That's what it was last time I went down and asked for any kind of public assistance there. I definitely and, promote using the Daily News Miner <laughs> well, for a Well, paper. the thing is, the churches will give you six rolls of toilet paper for six months, is last I heard from them. 
But if think about it, if you go in jail, they give you toilet paper. They give you t- you need toilet paper. Yeah, raise your hand. You get like I don't know. I was only in there like five days max, but I know they come in quite regularly and ask if anyone needs. Yeah, they need three hot meals too, and a nice place. Three, to three hot in a cot. Yeah, absolutely. You get everything you need in prison. But now, what if they took education. away the toilet paper in jail? I mean, would there be riots? They've rioted would, for less. I mean, I mean, so it, it's there's a riot control for issue. I mean, you control whether it's food or toilet paper. There's there's real power in that. So that's you know yes. You know, which party provides more toilet paper? You know, none. They don't even talk about toilet paper. I, I think you're right. I think we ought to lobby the Republicans and the Democrats to come up with a good party platform on toilet paper. When I hear Thank either one the of the parties talking, though, I feel the need to find some toilet paper. Well, I, you know, okay. <laughs> 458 Talk, the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Good morning. Hey, who is this? Hey, this is Claudia. Claudia, hey. what's on your mind? Hey, uh, I got a new fizz, no, fizz theory here. Uh, that two powers rise to the top. And you see there in, uh, in the Republican Party what's happened there in Anchorage now. You know, have a good guys took over the party. Now they, they're fighting. They're going to, and they're probably going to take them out before they, they take power again on the Republican Party. So sure. I think the fizz theory, you apply for that no matter what. That's what I see the mass to have on the whole government thing, you know, is it's just the scum of the earth that's get it getting charged, you know, always the good people are always underneath. Take the, the good thing go down to the bar and the well, Yeah, and we've talked to go to the top. We've talked about that quite a bit and uh Hans Hermann Hop Hoppe wrote an excellent book on it with uh, the democracy of the god that failed and his whole point in there is that you have to really be the guy that wins, the guy that stays in there, whatever. He's the good-looking guy, or not always good-looking guy, but the guy that can talk well. He doesn't have to have well. Sometimes he can have good intentions, but the fact of the matter is, to get to the top, you got to be a scumbag. The scumbags make it to the top, and the scumbags make it to the top and hang on to it. There's Look at no what's going on right now in the Republican Party. With you know, you've got the duly elected. Right, with Redrick and. Yep. Uh, Russ Millette. Russ Millette and those guys, they're fighting over it. And, but what what do you expect? I mean, I expected it wholeheartedly that that would happen. That, that's politics. That's why we reject politics. That's why we come on here and ask people to reject politics, because they're, your, good in, your good is not their intention. Their intention is their own good. Their intention is their own power. I mean, we saw that in the very beginning when they thought that um, one of the Ron Paul people might be elected to the chairmanship. They sapped all the money out. Mm-hmm. They took all the money out of the uh, the treasury or whatever and sent it to some other whatever. But well, that's, I mean, of this is going to do this that. is a great illustration though too of everything that we've talked about about not putting your hope in the political process to change things. Claudio, you were a Ron Paul supporter, right? Yes, I was, and I, I, I don't, I'm not going to vote anymore. This Aaron, <laughs> you guys, you, you, they you, show me the the light, you know. There's no point on it because, like I said, you no, know, the thing always is going to rise to the top. And well, and and people, Claudia tell us, is one of our newest, yeah, anarchist friends. They, they they tell us over and over again, you want to make a difference, you need to get out and vote. You mm-hmm. want to make a real difference, get involved in the political party. You want to change things. Get elected and go and go down there and change things in Juneau or Washington D.C. or which whatever is, else. Which is totally opposite of what uh, the founders of this country did. They did not vote their way to freedom. And I don't mean the Revolutionary War. I'm talking before that, during the ta- the, the 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 stamp tax, where people had to Parliament decided that in order for anyone in America to do business, which meant, uh, well, they had to buy the state's paper, which had a little stamp on it. So if you went to court, if you wanted to file something, you had to buy their paper, which had a tax associated with it. 
You couldn't just go down and buy a loaf, uh, wad of paper. So the only re- the only thing you could do is your kids could, you know, write their little deals in school without stamp paper. But no, you couldn't do anything else. If you wanted to get married, you had to use the official stamped paper. If you wanted to do a contract, you had to have the official stamped paper. It was a tax. And the people, they didn't vote their way out of getting rid of the ta- the stamp tax. They just refused to use it. They absolutely refused to use it. Massachusetts said, no, we we're not... You can't tax us. There's no representation. I I want to talk about that here in a little bit because it's very important. They said, no, we will not use your stamp paper for anything. So they refused and they used their own paper. Shipping documents. If you wanted to export your materials, if you didn't have that stamp shipping document, and it was just every legal document, every document had to be this certain paper. So the Royal Navy... When you took your goods out of America, they would come attack you and say, hey, where's your stamped paper? And if you didn't have it, they they confiscated Mm -hmm. confiscated your ship. So how did the American people get around that? They refused to obey the whole colonies, all of them, one at a time. And it was just a few good men. Samuel Adams was Mm -hmm. was awesome. Samuel Adams said, we will not do it. Oh, good beer. We will not do this. And... Patrick Henry was the one that started the whole thing. He stood up and said, we have rights as Americans. We will not obey this law. Which is funny because when Patrick Henry left, he got the the Virginia resolutions passed, right? And then he left, and then the committee re, rescinded all of them. Mm-hmm. But not before the whole country heard about it, which made people stand up. That's all it takes. It takes a couple people to stand mm-hmm. up and say, no. We're going to stand for what's right. And, and, you look and at it the, never was from voting. You look at the freedom lovers who joined in with the Ron Paul movement. They went down there to, to the, the party convention. They got the party platform changed. They got their Ron Paul supporters elected into leadership positions. Yay, we're making a change. Gee, look what's happening now. I just handed you the article. Yeah. I've been, I got a bunch of emails on the, it. The, so. the, the people who have been in power, Randy Redrick and his other Republican goons, are basically saying, no, we're not going to permit this. <laughs> we're not go- You stupid people, you weren't really Republicans. You only joined the party to get Ron Paul in. Who were they telling us? They were telling us for months prior to that, you really want to make a difference, come join the Republican Party. Right. Well, you come join the Republican Party. No, I'm vote. sorry, your vote doesn't count because... They told us you, to vote. You weren't a Republican before you joined us. And they're telling the people, how, how dare you think yeah. you can get in power? How dare you think? How dare you and try not, to get power for yourself? And I'm not saying that there's no good people that get to, you know, to the House representative or like Rompa was there for 30 something years, but what could he accomplish besides educate people? You know, he, he never was able to, to do much there. Because the whole system is so evil and corrupt, there's no way a good person is going to do a, a dance or a scratch at all. Yeah, because, I mean, it's proven right here in the little tiny Alaskan state Republican Party. A good person can advance. It's not the way the system's set up, though. You're not allowed to advance. Exactly. They I don't mean, want Ru- you to. Russ Mallet got elected to the leadership of the party, and now they're trying to get him thrown out before he's even taken office. Yeah. It's a joke. It the is. The whole thing's a joke. But voting's not the way to go anyways. Claudio. Look, have at it. Thank you very much for the phone call, brother. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. 458-TALK is the number. we got about four minutes before the top of the hour. We're going to uh, take a break there at that point for the Fox News to find out what is going on. Did you see, um, you know, talking about the debt limit stuff, Josh? No, I don't care. No, no, no. Did you see what Murkowski said? Oh, yeah. The, we can't The country stop. has to pay its bills. We have to raise the debt limit. Well, they can do what they want. I don't care. Uh, okay, how, if you how incur is it an obligation, paying? you have responsibility to pay that by going into debt. <laughs> how, how are you paying your bills by taking out more debt? You're not. How, what kind You're of an idiot is Murkowski? Debt. Oh. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, seriously. <laughs> what a... kind of an idiot says you have to take out more debt in order to pay your bills? And they will not stop spending at all. The administration got the tax increases they wanted. Now they must get serious about spending cuts. That's Don Young. 
Well, Don Young, why'd you give them the tax increases that they're because asking they promised for? that they were going to do a spending cut later. Give us the tax increases yeah. first, and then we'll give you the spending. whatever happened to tax no taxation without representation. Oh, what what does that mean? Now, if we are represented adequately, can they tax us whatever they decide? No, no, I'm, we're going to get into that here in the next hour because it's a bunch of bull crap, and I'm sick and tired of it. Just like I was talking about the voting with the tax stamp, the stamp tax. You know what those people did? They went before the tax started, which I think was November 1st of 1967 or 8 or 6. 1766 to 68, somewhere in there. Sorry, I don't know the exact date, but it was a few hundred years back, and I don't remember. The people would go to the tax collectors, the stamp, because you they would hire someone that was in charge of passing out these stamp papers. The people went directly to them, thousands not just like two or three people say, can we talk to you? You would have 2,000 people go to their house and say, hey, you will resign your position effective immediately or we'll burn your house down. And Hooray for at the mob. first, the people, the tax collectors were like, whatever. So they burnt their house down. Well, the mobs... Which I'm actually good. I'm good with those mobs because they got together and they went out and said, this is wrong. We're standing for our liberty. You will not tax us. You will immediately resign your position. If you don't, there will be consequences. Every single stamp tax collect or uh, distributor resigned, except in North Carolina. Right off the bat, they just resigned. North Carolina tried for a little while. Then his house got raised and put to the ground. My point was, though, none of them voted that tax out. Parliament finally rescinded the the stamp tax because the people would not obey the law. The agents for the government were so afraid to even bring it up. They hid. They actually had to hide the paper because when the colonists found it, they burnt it. They burnt the paper. They burned and for all of those the states' papers. All of those Tea Party people in the Republican establishment. What was the original Tea Party all about? I was going to get to that too. I mean, they did didn't they vote? Did they didn't wait? Did they commit an act of vandalism, John? Uh huh. They committed an act of vandalism. What? A bunch of criminals. They uh, would call the people that were the tax collectors or the the implementers of the stamp tax. They called them enemies of liberty and traitors to their country. Enemies of liberty and traitors to their country. It seems like we got quite a number of those around. Now we am looking across bow the down borough. to them because we got our guns. That's Four, five, eight. Need. Talk is the number. Hour two coming up after the news. If you have right here on KFAR, it's local talk radio, but we're streaming live on the internet, KFAR660.com. We are also on your smartphone. If your phone is smart, you can check that out. At the TuneIn Radio app and download it free. I'm going to open up the chat room, by the way, right now, just to kind of make sure that I've got my ways of letting people sound off there. Uh, I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. Joining me in the studio today, Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises. Josh, how are you doing? Good. A friend of mine just said TuneIn app sucks in 1G. He's down in the Nana. Oh, if you only have one G, yeah. yeah. No, if you you gotta have a, you gotta have a reliable data service in, in order for it to work, because it's like anything else that you use with data, even like streaming on the internet. You gotta have enough. Gotta data have some and, horses yeah. behind it. Exactly. And every time I, but, and that's what I tell people, anytime that you use the TuneIn Radio app, be connected to the internet. And make sure you use a Wi-Fi service, because it's gonna cost you a lot of money for all the data you're gonna use. Data minutes. But, but it's but it is really cool. I was able to listen when I was in Arizona. Yeah, that's pretty good. I was able to listen to the TuneIn Radio. In fact, I just used it this morning. I didn't want to go into the other room. I was too lazy to go into the other room and turn on the radio. I just uh, turned on my app on the phone. and Oh, look, we're on the air. Everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's just probably made you feel good. All right. You, you, you were mentioned, gone and things are still rolling. Yeah, exactly. And also, it's a reminder that nobody is really indispensable. <sighs> Anybody can be replaced. Mm. And you know what? It's kind of funny if you think about it because everybody dies eventually right so yeah, we're, I heard. we're all replaceable in fact it's designed to be that way if there's something that you are doing for your life that you want to continue after you're gone you're going to have to pass it on 
And this is why people have children. So you can pass on your belief. <laughs> is that what it, oh. And just kind of a funny. Hey, before before the the top of the hour, you were talking about taxation without representation. What did you mean by yes. that? Yes, yes. Today's America, we. No, this is just going to be my opinion, but I'm going to back it up with some history. Today's America, we say that uh, we have representation because we have a. Well, Alaska has a congressman and two senators, which. Senators weren't really supposed to be the people's representatives originally. The federal government, with the passing of the income tax, taxes us directly on our income, which would have never flew, never flown 200 years ago. I mean, they wouldn't even allow the colonists. The colonists who had a king, they had a dictator. They still wouldn't allow him to tax them internally or externally. They said, no, you don't have the right to tax us. We only have the right to be taxed by our consent. What was the consent? Parliament, they said, wasn't consent. So let's call our Congress Parliament or equate our Congress to the Parliament. We would say today, if we were really Americans, that Congress doesn't have the right to tax us because they don't have our consent. They say that it's a voluntary tax and we consent by paying it, obviously because the threat of violent force against us if we don't do that. But originally what we would have was our assemblies would decide what they could tax us and then they would decide what they would send off to the federal government. So our borough assembly originally... Taxation, no taxation without representation was because you only could be taxed by the closest local government that you had. So our closest local government would be first our councils, with city councils and stuff. They would decide what tax they could tax their residents to pay the borough, the assembly. The assembly would decide what they would tax Basically, with the uh, actually the sim, I'm using that wrong. Basically, the cities would, but we'll use the borough instead of the cities because the city would actually be the closest government, and they would be the only ones that could tax. Except for you. those who don't actually live inside the city, then us. they wouldn't be taxed. Period. So, but we'll use the assembly since they're more far-reaching, quite far-reaching. So the borough assembly would decide what our tax rate was. And then we would decide whether we were going to pay it or not. That was taxation without representation. That was tax by consent. If we didn't agree with what the borough decided to tax us for, why we would get our pitchforks and shovels and we'd go down there and say, no, not going to happen. You may not tax us for this. But the federal government would not be taxing us. The state governments would not be taxing you. That was considered taxation without representation because who who is President Obama? Well, he was elected duly. He's still not representing. He doesn't know Steve Floyd. He doesn't know Josh Bennett. He doesn't know our wants, our desires, our needs, or anything. He doesn't know Bo Diddley either. No. He doesn't know any of that. Lisa Murkowski, Don Young, they don't know us for anything. They don't know what we want or what we need. They cannot represent us because they don't even know us there's no representation there the borough assembly at the very least could because they're a local and we could go over there and say hey nut job you shall not do this we don't want this we don't want that still tyrannical but that's because originally the colonists would take action take things into their own hands, which they felt that they had the right to do. Not because, only did they feel Because they that, had the right to self-defense. They, they had, had the them. right to liberty. They had the right to be free men. They said it over and over and over. I mean, Samuel Adams, he said, what, what is this tax when, when I was talking about the, uh, the stamp tax? Actually, the Sugar Act, when they, the parliament was taxing sugar, molasses. And he said, what is this? They can tax our our foods and our goods? He said, what's next? Next thing you know, they'll actually say that they'll be able to tax our own land. And there was a, that, he said that as a joke. Like, ah, ha, ha. <coughs> Excuse me. That was a joke. 
well, they can tax our goods. Next thing, they're, actually, it was trade. They can tax our trade. Next thing you know, they'll tax our lands. <laughs> uh, uh, mm-hmm. So funny. Uh huh. When people argue about um, property taxes, they say, well, property taxes are legal and good and constitutional. No. Our founding fathers, the people that started, the radicals, the liberals, said no. You couldn't tax their property. They would never stand. That's why I was going back to our uh, standing up for our gun rights. Well, when are we going to stand for anything else? Anything. 200 years ago, you wouldn't stand for your assemblymen to make any law against you. You know, we didn't have standing armies. We had militias. And sometimes they would conscript people to be in the militia to go fight some Indians or France or whoever they wanted to go beat up. And the people would say yes or no. They'd say, no, nah, we're not going to go join the militia. And the assembly would get mad and say, hey, you have to do it because we told you to. And they say, no. Nah. Well, they'd go down, they'd nullify the assembly and basically kick them out and have another election. Happened time and time and time again. You had basic representation and if you didn't didn't feel represented they were knocked out they were taken out not killed they were just like okay dissolved you're done when a governor would get mad at assembly for not taxing the people the way he wanted them to tax them and he would nullify or strip the assembly say oh you're no longer an assembly assembly would just say okay well we were voted in by the people directly and usually they would just come back together and have their meetings anyways and say, ha, ha, whatever. And if the governor got mean and tried to set up his own militia to go beat up that assembly, why, the people would get together and they'd go down to his house and say, what do you, who do you think you are? You're nothing but a mere mortal like the rest of us. Call off your goons, we'll burn your house down. Okay, okay. So many times the officials of the king were threatened And it was funny, they never threatened to kill any of them. And they never did. They never killed, as far as I know, there's probably some story out there. They never killed anyone. But they threatened them to the fact of, we will consider you an enemy of liberty and of this country. And, you know, when people call in here and they say, you know, we talk about common law and stuff, and we go, well, what if someone did this or that and this or that, and then how would they be... They'd go to court or whatever, and they'd be an outlaw. No one would do business with them. People have mocked us about that. Oh, well, what if so-and-so decided to do business with them anyways? And blah, blah, blah. We're not talking about anything that has not happened. That society happened here in America. You were considered an enemy of liberty and a traitor to the country. And people would not trade with you. They would not talk to you. They wouldn't do anything with you. They'd have nothing... Most of the times, those governors, assemblymen, the tax collectors, the councilmen, whatever, they would end up fleeing back to Britain to get away because they couldn't even go buy a loaf of bread. If you think about it, the same kind of thing happens here, but it's bass backwards. <laughs> here it's happening if the government accuses you of something, even if you have not been charged with any crime, much less convicted, the very fact that you have been accused of something by the government will get you kicked off airplanes. It'll get you, you'll lose your job. You might not even be able to get another job later. You think about it. You look at even the, the way people have turned their back on the Schaefer-Cox issue. And you look at how this local community who was, I mean, so that, that Second Amendment task force, I was in some of those meetings with literally thousands of Fairbanksons. The people happily carrying their guns that I mean, where where are they now? Well, yeah, Aaron and I were accused of uh, Aaron more so. You know, why you guys didn't stand up? Well, Aaron and I were actually the only ones that stood up for those guys vocally from day one. I called into a radio show and people were going, "Oh, well, you know, it was coming. He deserved it," <laughs> and everyone's backtracking. I called the radio show that day and said, "How dare you guys do this? You're feeding into the government's hands. The media is going to tear these people up enough." We don't need to tear up one of our own citizens. Let the media do it. Let's find out what's really going on. And then Aaron, of course, was accused of being an FBI agent himself or an informant because he didn't go to jail. Or because, well, look at them. They're 
they're speaking out against this constantly and they haven't been thrown in jail. Well, we were definitely interrogated several times. My house was raided. Aaron and I actually did something for these people. We helped out Michael Anderson as much as we could monetarily. Um, we, we were, he stayed, we were he stayed at the, your house. Yeah, for months. We took care of his family too. Not scratching my back. I'm just saying that's been going on here a little bit. Some of these accusations and kind of irritates me because we actually put our your lives, your yeah, your fortunes. We put our feet where our mouth was. We put we took action to what we talked about. But the, and you, you you talk about that issue of would the government or would the society shun somebody who's been declared an, an outlaw? outlaw? And it happens now. Right, but it's the, it, it's the government. Like you said, it's back ass mm-hmm. words because the government's doing it. When we should be shunning politicians and they should get the same treatment that we do to our own citizens. We do this to our own people. We do it to ourselves. It's so disgusting. We're so far gone. People talk about, we need to get back to where we were with the founding fathers. And people don't even know what it was. Yeah. People don't even have a clue today. When you hear them call radio shows on Sean or whatever, even local shows, they don't have a freaking clue what it was like 200 years ago to be libertarian, to be for liberty, and I say libertarian loosely, to be a liberal of the the, the classical liberal Classical sense. liberal, yeah. They don't have a clue what those people were like. That's because they don't read. They don't read. If, if they anything, refuse. If anything, they get a little watered down... Cliff note version of history from their public education. From which, the state. If you think, again, if you read, if you've ever read 1984 by George Orwell, you know what history books are like. Mm-hmm. They are written by the powers that be specifically to justify their own position. And it happens now in America, just like it's happened in dictatorial countries like North Korea. Would our public school system tell kids today the true story of our history, of our founding? The true story of this of I would love it if they would tell the true story after the French and Indian War, when Parliament decided that they were going to, since the French were no longer a problem, they were going to turn their attention towards those crazy Americans that were part of the colony. That's the kind of history they need to teach, but they won't because that was history of quote unquote rebellion, quote unquote resistance, and it was. And it was for the people. The people saw themselves as the country. The people, they didn't see parliament. They didn't see the king. He was just like a figurehead. They were absolutely loyal to the king. At the same time, they said, but you can't tell us what to do. You can't tax us. They did They did see his authority in some laws. But as far as taxation and stuff, that was a, that was a right of the Englishman. It was a constitutional right. People didn't even know that they had... They would talk constitutions back then. They never, it wasn't a written one, but they would call it, you know, our constitutional right have been, they've been crushed. We can't be taxed without representation. And here we think that we have representation because we have a congressman in Congress. We, the, we all we had don't the opportunity even know, to vote right, for Right, we don't even know what representation means anymore. Well, people don't even bother to go to the borough assembly meetings to find out what's going on at the most local level. That's true. I don't they, like pe- to go either. People don't. Well, I don't like to sit in a chair that's below them. They sit up above me. That's totally back ass words too. They should be on their knees while we're telling them what's up. <laughs> Seriously, that's how. That is how it was. It's not the way it is today. Today, there's nothing remotely close. Today, what our Founders were what this country was founded on, how it used to run. There's nothing close. There's n- You can't look at anything going on today and say, oh, there's some resemblance. It's all been changed. Well, and if, if anything, you've basically got a, a structure that looks like the, the building that we think we know. Right. And as we get up closer, we go inside, we realize, no, this isn't that at all. It'd be like if somebody had taken and bought an old church and gutted it and turned it into a whorehouse. Well, and we look, at, at, a di- at a distance, you look at it and you say, oh, look at that nice church. Right. And then you come up and you say, I think I'm going to go inside. And, and you find and, out they've and, prostituted and, it. Exactly. Just like our government's prostituted itself. I mean, because we see, well, we got a Congress and a president and a Supreme Court. So, yep, we're the same as we were. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, let's. Uh, Do you want to see what's on the phone here? Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hey, this is Hillbilly Man. Hillbilly Man, what's on your mind? <laughs> You're almost speaking my mind, but I want to go a little bit further and. Like I some to do. I hope I'm not offensive to folks, and I'm mainly only talking to Christians. But the fact of the matter is, they are hurtling now. In other words, everybody kind of feels it. Things are going faster now. It's like they're playing all their cards. I mean, like personally, I've told you before. I think they are going to take the guns. I think we should just watch and see. Won't be very long through one fiat or another, and I believe people will actually give them up. I don't think there'll be much of a pip squeak about it. I don't think they'll necessarily come out to the middle of nowhere to get their guns, but I think that they will start collecting up the guns, and people will begin. Well, you know, Hillbilly, I had a, I had a caller yesterday who said specifically that uh, that he basically he admitted that he would give up his guns mm-hmm. because he said, well, when they come to get my guns, I will have already modified them so that they'll be legal. <laughs> Well, the point is, though, they're headed for such a futuristic tyranny, okay? There's either going to be tyranny or chaos. The way we're headed, it either has to turn out tyranny or chaos. If tyranny, in other words, if civilization is able to continue, it's going to be one of absolute coercion, absolute, uh, you know, snooping and and squealing on each other. It's going to be that kind of, of dystopia. That's where they're headed. Well, and that's not where we're headed. It's where we are. It's where we are, Hillbilly. Look, I mean, yeah. there was a guy that was just arrested and thrown in jail. He got a five-year sentence for something he posted on Facebook. Right. Okay. So the other, so the only real solution is eventually, if you look at it, if you look at it like a, a science fiction novel, what would be the thing you'd be saying to the hero at this point in the story? You'd be saying, "Get the hell out, man." Get the, you know what I'm saying? So that's my constant yeah. preaching, of course, is get, get out of hell. hell. Yeah. At least, yeah, yeah, yeah. At least Please. learn how to. Yeah, at least learn how to. Keep a bag packed by the door with a gun so that when the lights go out, because that's what I expect to happen, when the electricity is just shut down, that's how they're going to get total submission from about 99% of the population. But you've yeah. the power. Yeah, I don't doubt that eventually. When the emergency is declared, you can pack up and go quick. Get the hell out. They want the guns, there's no doubt. I. When uh, part of the purpose of saying, you know, they're not going to take your guns and stuff like that, it's just uh, it's kind of to mock the people that have guns because, you know, what I was talking about the last hour, people stood up and said, you shall not take my guns. We're going to stand up. Well, on one side of it, I can see where the government wouldn't really care if you have a gun or not because you're in total submission to them anyways. Let them have their little guns. Who cares? They're still going to feed us everything that we ask them to. Besides the fact, I mean, all we have is pea shooters compared to what the government has, and that's not what the they second... They want you to have guns. They're going to bring such chaos into the cities by the very fact of the people having guns. Once they cut off the food supply, people are going to shoot the hell out of each other, and that's going to save the government a lot of trouble. <laughs> Yeah, no yeah. doubt. And then look at what happened. To, and look at what happened in Katrina, two thousand six. And people and will be clamoring. It's a tragedy. Yeah, yeah. The food trucks didn't arrive in Chicago. Fifty thousand people were killed. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. And that's how they'll get banks to submit. They'll just cut off the food. Yeah, and then people the will, be, will line up on the highway to get on the bus. And they'll gladly turn their weapons over. Well, yeah, you can't get on a bus with a gun. No. Well, that's what happened here in uh, 2004, was it? We had uh, that strike down there in Los Angeles, and mm-hmm. we, we missed one shipment. Mm-hmm. And for th- all of a sudden, three days later, there was literally nothing on the shelves yeah. in Fairbanks. So McDonald's go, even ran out of hamburgers. <laughs> let it go two weeks where people are going, well, what's the answer? What's the government going to do? What's the government going to do? Where the radio's down and nobody's talking to you. And then all of a sudden, in comes the Army saying, okay, here's the answer. Get on the bus. We'll feed you. Well, well, yeah, if you ain't ate for two weeks, you're going to get on the bus. That's get on the sure. bus. If you've been scraping it for two weeks, you'll get on the bus. That's, like that's just where we're headed, man. Sheep to the slaughter. Mm-hmm. Have a great day. Hey, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? You still there? Hello. Hey, who is this? Reason. Hello, this is Doug. Doug, go ahead. What's on your mind? Hey, uh, you know, I this listen to this makes me think back to when I was uh, stationed in the Army up here in the early 90s. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers, but we were doing some urban warfare training over off of the Mitchell Expressway in the 
uh, in the, the housing areas over there. Yep. And uh, we were supposed to be coming in and land an aircraft and getting out and pretending we were assaulting the, an area over there. Well, during that same time, uh, I was I was pulled aside, a large group of us were, and we were given a survey that was issued by the, the – uh, I don't remember who it was by the U.S., the Department of Defense, Department of the Army, 6th Infantry Division or what, but I distinctly remember some of the questions, or some of the questions, but one of them that sticks in my mind was that if you were given the order to go from house to house and confiscate weapons, would you follow that order? Because, you know, as an NCO, you're bound to disobey any unlawful order. Mm-hmm. But I just, I, I never forget that. And that was back in the early 90s that someone somewhere was thinking about this type of thing, you know, this scenario that you guys are leaning towards. 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was stationed here in uh, 94 is when I actually got here. Were you still here then? I was. Yeah, I, I, I was there till 95. All right. So we were probably over there at Fort Wainwright brushing, I sold, uh, brushing sh- uh, shoulders with each other. <laughs> Yeah, Didn't yeah, you? possibly. Yeah, there's a very good chance you came through one of the classes I taught there. <laughs> yeah, that's very possible. I uh, I spent a and, and you know what, you might have been through one of my classes. Did you ever do any language training at all? I did not. No, nope. right. that part. <laughs> well, no, well, we we did, we did some language stuff for some of the the soldiers that were deploying down to Haiti and other Oh, yeah, places. I went there. Yeah. yeah. So what was the general consensus for the question? Oh, an, an absolutely, absolute no. And and you know if you've ever been in a military environment, they all kind of look up to the boss, you know, because we're kind of cruising through this thing together, and my team's in there, and they're kind of looking at me. I'm like, what the hell? There's no way. <laughs> no way would I ever do this. Hmm. You know, and I'm looking at all my guys, and neither you're, would you. You're not in the military anymore, are you? <laughs> Hey, brother, oh, no. we're, we're up against the clock. Thanks for the call. Oodle lolly, oodle lolly, golly, what a day. Welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio. Uh, Josh Bennett is over there across the board from me uh, from Big Horn Enterprises. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. You guys Don't hired me to come in here this. and basically make sure you got your message on the radio. Uh, but over the last year and a half, I feel like I have real that you you've convinced me <gasps> in in many ways about the uh, the nature of things and the way that um, we're headed as a society and the futility of trying to play their own game. It's like if you go and you play a game with somebody who keeps changing the rules on you, at what point do you say, you know what, I don't want to play anymore? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I hate to bring it up. But yeah, that, Randy. The, you know, the... Uh, yeah, Republican head of the Republican Party here. Mm-hmm. Oh, gee, what? You voted somebody else in that I don't agree with? I will not permit that. Uh, the the tra- the horrible, tragic situation with the hostages in Algeria. The, what do they say? All of the hostages All of them are, dead. are dead. And, you know, you look at that and you think to yourself, boy, it's really good the government went in there and rescued them, right? Have you ever thought, I mean, if, if you had a rancher hmm. with a bunch of cows and some rustlers came out and stole, you know, five, ten head of cow, you know, not a whole lot, uh, you certainly can't let the rustlers get away because then it's going to encourage other people to come and steal your cattle. Yeah. So if you responded with overwhelming force and killed all the rustlers and accidentally killed the cows that they stole, you really wouldn't care. Because it's not the individual theft of the cows that mattered. It was the principle that someone would dare to come and steal your cows. Hmm. Better to have your cows dead than to have them in the hands of the rustlers. And I'm just I'm just wondering if anybody has thought about that in terms of the trust that they put in the government to come and rescue the hostages. Are they do they really care? No. About rescuing those poor I don't think so. civilians? <laughs> they care about their power and how dare you touch our civilians. Those are our cattle. Exactly. You but can't you can't come into my pen they and don't take care my about cow. people, otherwise they wouldn't kill people. And they kill people all the time. It's just like guns. They don't hate guns. The left, the right, whatever. The government doesn't hate guns. They love them when they have them. They just don't like us to have them. Well, even even then, what Timothy said was making a lot of, a lot of sense. If you can take that same kind of squabbling that we're seeing in the within the parties or between the parties, and extend it out into society as a whole, 
people who are going to take that argument beyond simply words and take it into the realm of shooting each other, then it makes the, the people that are left over after the fighting that much easier to control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the government's not against killing either. I mean, there, there's a lot of people that enjoy murder and killing. A lot of them, because of that, they get into the government because then they get to do it legitimately. But governments don't hate guns. They don't hate murders. They don't hate death. They just don't like it when they get killed. They don't like it when we have guns. They're all for them having guns. The best weaponry in the world. They're all for... Feinstein's all for having her own gun. Concealed weapon. Right? How many of the congressmen? They all have guns. You'd never take theirs away from them. You see the picture I'm showing you over here on... uh... That the, there's a fellow in the opposition party in Bulgaria today survived an assassination attempt. He was given a speech, member of the opposition, and some guy wearing a pass. I mean, he was there legally. He had a gun, I'm assuming legally. He ran up and jumped on the stage, pulled out his gun, put it to the guy's head, and pulled the trigger. It misfired. Wow. You know, the look on his face there, the, the politician who was given the speech, he's got this look of shock on his face as he's looking into the barrel of the gun pointed right at this head. Well, that's a good lesson for us. Don't buy Bulgarian-made weapons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> 458 Talk is the number. We'll go to the phones. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hello, is that me? It might be you. It depends on who hey. it is. What's your uh, name? You know, wait, wait. Sorry. What's your name? Rick? Mr. Rick. Rick, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, you know, uh, I would not want to be one of those Besides, I wouldn't want to be one of the hostages. But in that country, when they get a hold of the ones that took the hostages, they will punish them. They won't say, well, you know, he had a mental defect. You know, he was easily led. Come on, people. Let's, let's re, re, you know, train him so he won't do this again. We'll let him play with puppies. We'll send him to college. We'll feed him. Give him a nice hotel. Oh, that's a jail, but it's just like a hotel. You know, instead... That guy is going to be stretched out in the sun, probably scun alive, and had his every part of his body cut off before he died. You know, and I'm probably going to get people calling in saying that I'm a mean, cruel person. It's just that we don't we don't punish people in this country anymore. That's all I got to say. Have a great day, and uh, thanks for answering my call. Thank you for calling in. We have more people in prison than the other civilized nations combined, though. I mean, I don't under... I hear... Is that Rick? That was... He's still... He's gone. I hear him calling up a lot, telling... Just lately, he's been calling a lot of the shows, saying, you know, we don't punish enough. We don't punish enough. We don't punish enough. But punish what? I don't understand. And he says, you break the rules, you get punished. I don't necessarily agree with the rules in the first place myself. And I definitely don't agree with you stretching a guy out in the sun and pulling his body parts off and all that kind of stuff. That's We live in America. And we have the right to trial by jury. And we have the right not to be punished with uh, such instruments. Cruel and unusual punishment is not allowed here. Torture is not allowed here. And Wait. following the rules, what? we are... Uh, Torture country- is not allowed here? <laughs> well, it is. It wasn't supposed to be allowed. Oh, it wasn't supposed to be allowed here. And following the rules, we're a country that was uh, basically started by breaking those rules. Actually, we we were very law-abiding. Our country's always been a very law-abiding people. Even the founders during the Revolutionary War, they're very law-abiding they demanded that the government follow the law also. That was the difference. There wasn't two sides where government could play by one set of rules and the people had to play by the other set of rules. The whole point of the revolution was we all play by the same rules, baby. You don't want to play by the rules? We're going to throw you off. Today, we have the exact opposite. Every law they pass, they (laughs) exempt themselves. Even Obamacare, 
Yeah. How many how many of our politicians have to be a part of Obamacare? Zero. Zero. Zero of them. But it's so good we get to follow it. We have to follow well, it. Or out, or if we don't we have to pay that? we have to pay a fine. Where's the outcry with that? How come our state representatives have not nullified Obamacare? <laughs> Now, I don't think our state representatives are capable of nullifying anything that they're told to do. I mean, you, you look at even at the proposal that is uh, before the state house right now that Chenault introduced about uh, basically not just giving us the power to disobey the federal gun laws, right. but actually issuing orders to arrest any federal agent who tries to enforce the gun laws. The gun laws. Who, why? Why? Well, even then, I mean, you think about it, I don't think it's going to pass. Well, even if it did, who cares? I mean, the gun laws? Mm-hmm. What about every other stinking law that they should nullify? Why isn't the Patriot Act nullified? Why isn't the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021, 1022, nullified by our state? Because we have elected people who think that it is their right to govern us. And, and we have elected people, period. <laughs> You know, Natalie Howard said something the ones that nullified it awesome anyways. this week. That it, I, and I give credit where credit is due. I think, believe she was quoting a book that I, last week Aaron Bennett said that you guys have been reading uh, the same book. Oh yeah. And uh, so she was Rose quoting Rose Wilder Lane. That's it, Rose Wilder Lane. She was quoting it, and she said that the the most the complaint that people give is not that we are being governed, but that we are not being governed properly. <laughs> Absolutely correct. We are not being governed properly. Just about every call we get. Every call I hear on every show. We're not being governed properly. We need to have the right people governing us, by golly. Why? Who wants to be governed? We need more laws to change the laws that are restricting us. We need our laws. We need to give us a law that's going to govern us more properly. Yeah. Well, we need to laugh a little bit more at our politicians and mock them so they know what we think of them. Oh. You want to go to the phones? 458-TALK, the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Lee. Lee, go ahead. Hey, um, you were commenting about two sets of rules, the ones that the government followed and the ones the civilians have to follow. And if you don't think that's uh, happening currently, just look at what happened at the Ted Stevens trial. His <laughs> government lawyers went uh, quite a bit of array. And it would appear, I guess just on outward appearances, that one of them might have had some conscience that he committed suicide as to how bad his behavior probably was in that situation. But the rest of them, I think, walked. Was there anybody prosecuted or held accountable for the wrongdoing they did to Mr. Stevens that gave baggage his, uh, his royalty? Now, hang on a second. You're, you're, you're kind of rewriting history a little bit here because... No, I'm just uh, asking. Ted's, is that correct? I, I don't think... No, I, um, they, they found after the investigation that there was nothing to prosecute. There was not wrongdoing. There was, there was an, an oversight. It's what I it was. Understand. It has been portrayed by those who are totally devoted to this idea of Ted Stevens as a hero. There's no possible way he could have been corrupt. They have been rewriting history to make it somehow that that it was this misconduct by the prosecution that got him prosecuted. No. The only thing they could find is that they accidentally did not give uh, one piece of evidence over the defense that the defense might have been able to twist in two something that they could use for Ted Stevens. It was a technicality, and there was disciplinary action taken, but after further investigation, they could not find anything to prosecute, and the very people who had been disciplined had that expunged from their record because they found that there was nothing worth doing there. Did Have you followed that at all, or have you just completely bought into Ted Stevens is my hero? No, no, I haven't. My, co- my comment was only intended to show that one of their lawyers committed suicide during this pending uh, review of what went on, and my guess was, and it's a guess, that he didn't do that based on things that he didn't do illegally. It was based on things that he most probably did yeah. illegally. There's a good point with that. I mean, we've talked about before when a officer gets on the stand, from what I've been told, he can dutifully lie and not be prosecuted for it, and yet... If a common citizen gets on the stand mm-hmm. and he lies, he can be held in contempt well, for perjury. Even then, the common citizen issue, look at those those different rules. Uh, a caller, uh, Lee? 
Yeah. Uh, if I came to your house and I said, and this this to me is just an illustration of the corruption of Ted Stevens, okay? If I came to your house and I said, Lee, I'm going to leave this jacuzzi at your house. You can use it anytime you want to. It's still my jacuzzi, but I'm just going to leave it here at your house for you to use. Would you accept that gift to you, or would you say, no, no, Steve, um, that right there, you see, that sounds like you're giving me a gift? Well, if I was in Ted's place, yeah, I would have to agree with your analogy. I wouldn't accept that. Well, you know, he got a, what was it, a $1,200 leather massage chair that was put in his office, and his excuse was, well, that didn't belong to me. That's Bill Allen's chair. He just lets me use it, and he's left it here at my office. That is corruption, Lee, and that to me was just the tip of the iceberg. It illustrated to me the way that not just this one politician, Ted Stevens, was, but the way in my mind, um, well, pretty much all of them are. How many politicians do you know that are worth more now having served our country than they were than they were worth before they started service? Well, all of them. All, all of them. them. And I think probably the biggest, the most uh elaborate case in point is the current president. Yeah, exactly. The current president, if we, you know, the economy in his eyes can't be too bad because the boy became a millionaire, not overnight, but in the first term for sure, multi-millionaire. Well, even his service in the Senate, I mean, it, it doesn't take being elected to the highest office in the land to get rich off of people's tax dollars. Oh, yeah. But that pales compared to what has happened to him since he became president. Oh, yeah. All the presidents. Yeah. Well, and and look, at, look at Bill Clinton as a great example. Money. Yeah, don't look too close to Uncle Bill with his uh, his previous drug dealings in Arkansas. We don't want to go there for uh, sure. <laughs> we thanks for the call. Appreciate yeah, it. I'm making some good no, good bank on that. Uh, but back to the gun, the citizens versus the privilege. I mean, you can go on websites and they, you can find uh, like a gun website. They say law enforcement only. They can purchase things that we can't. Mm, that we can't. Like a little blade, like a little knife where you can press a button and the blade comes out and goes back in. Law enforcement can have that, but we can't. Why aren't we allowed to trust ourselves with such a thing? I mean, if I want to have this little knife where I press a button and the blade comes out, it should be up to me. If they can have it, why can't I? If it's right for them, it's right for me. That was the point of the colonists. For one... You can't tell us what to do and then do the opposite. Actually, they said you can't tell us what to do, period, but they definitely wouldn't allow that. Definitely not. The ruling class, I mean, we talk about class society, and there is. There's a ruling class, and there's the ruled. We are the ruled. We have to decide whether we want to live that way forever or not. And at some point, you have to ask yourself a question that Hillbilly keeps asking. When are you going to flee? Yeah. If you've if you've drawn a line somewhere in your mind that says, well, if when things get bad enough, I'll leave. You you ought to re-examine where that line is. Because at some point you're not going to be able to leave. <laughs> the, you can't keep putting off leaving. Uh, okay, great example. I mean, again, wisdom literature. You look at the old story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Lot Run. and his, Lot and his family were instructed to leave. Don't even look back. They did not leave until the last second, and it, even then they, they were, were pulled, drug out, <laughs> dragged out of the city. <laughs> and as they were fleeing to the hills, Lot's wife turned and looked back, and she was taken in the destruction along with the city. I, you ask yourself, are you going to wait until somebody drags you out? For you to flee, because you know what? They drag you out. They're probably not going to be dragging you out to safety. (laughs) Get on the rail car! Get on the bus! You. 458 Citizen. Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Good morning. Is this Cecily? Yes, it is. How are you? (laughs) I couldn't uh, not call. (laughs) Um, It sounds like somebody's begging for for a spanking. (laughs) Anyway, as far as... uh, Rick, anyway, but uh, a constant punishment does not help. You have to have understanding. Uh, punishment only makes people angry, and it's, and and then and then the the people in the United States are are not understanding that the that that our drones are killing many children, and and that's what they should stand up against the war against 
just, I mean, if, if you can go out and look at somebody in the face and shoot them dead, you have to live with that your whole life. But if you're just pushing buttons, it, I mean, then it, it just, it, there's no, anyway, uh, as, as, as um, Don Quixote's birthday the other day, in, he says in it, there's no, uh, he has held people in his arms who were dying. And he said, and they had the question in their eyes, it wasn't, why they were dying, but why they had lived, and that's the question. Oh, I love I love that 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 perspective. Thanks, Cecily, for the Thank call. You. Appreciate that. Four five eight talk is the number. I think we have a diluted, why have we lived a diluted mindset of punishment through. I mean, you, we're taking we are mixing punishments and justice, justice and these things, and we're mixing states mm -hmm. with this stuff and there's no justice with states there's only but punishment i have a few children and i have spanked them on the butt when they've done things that were absolutely wrong that they knew they should not do and i think i don't feel bad about it i mean i feel bad in the fact that i had to do it but i mean i don't think well now they're only more angry at me because that's not true. Well, if I mean, it, I'm, if it I'm ends, a Christian and I'm told to do that. If it ends with the spanking and there's no restoration afterwards. Well, exactly. You can't I mean, just that, go. I'm not talking about going in there with the big boy and going, whack, the, the <laughs> knocking them around. The saying, point of any. I rule you. The point of any kind of light is to get to the restoration part. To get it's it called to, discipline. To get to their heart when their right. heart comes back to you and says, I'm sorry. I don't want to do that again. Yeah, you know, she was talking about looking somebody in the face when you kill them, and how we have now so sanitized warfare that people, it's like they're playing video games. Yeah, you know, It's you, affecting them, though. I've read stories about it where they're actually coming up, they're getting PTSD, too, mm -hmm. now, yeah. because they know they're killing people. Well, and you look at the high rate of suicide in our, our armed forces. Higher now, than it, ever. More people, more soldiers died this year, or last year, 2012, than died in combat. Right. More soldiers died from uh, Suicide. suicide. Have you ever you've seen the movie Braveheart? Oh yeah, it's one of my kids' favorite movies. We let them watch it. We encourage them to watch it. It's very, very, very violent. Very, it's not very good. The too. violence that we're trying to get across. In fact, the violence is it's heart stopping because it is so I mean, gruesome. Face to face. And that's the whole point. That's the way combat used to be, and to sit with the kids and say, "Look at that." Look at what you had to do in warfare back in the 1300s. That was, I mean, you do not go to war lightly when you know that you are going to be sticking a hook into somebody's gut. The king sure did, though. They didn't mind yeah, so much. Yeah, exactly. And, and, they and didn't mind so much the, at all. The end. I mean, they had a hundred years war. Come on. A hundred years, yeah. <laughs> The end of that movie, where the torture scene, and to the, to look at the resolve in William Wallace, as he is saying, he, he will not yield no matter what the pain is. I don't know anybody today that has that kind of a threshold of pain. You look at Americans right now, and we, we go and we pop a pill for... Everything. Oh, I've got a little headache today. Everything. Oh, I don't yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what our resolve is, because the day of reckoning, I believe, is a coming, mm -hmm. and so far we've not resolved to stand for our liberties at all. We won't even admonish our legislators to fight for our liberties. I mean, yeah, I don't have much hope there. I do enough to where I still come in every Saturday to right. call out to the few out there that may have their mind changed, may and, to encourage them, whatever. But And that's the thing, too, is that if you know that there are others out there, you're, it's going to be easier to a certain degree to stand up. The remnant. To know that, I mean, well, you remember the, the story of Elijah and how depressed he was because he felt like he was the only guy who had not bowed the need to bail. Mm -hmm. And he, even after all of the the great demonstrations of power over the idols... He was still depressed. I'm the only one. <laughs> and God reminded him, dude, I've still got 7,000 people who have not bailed, bowed their knee to bail. Yeah, they're, 
There are the there are some still today that have not bowed their knee to Baal, which gives me hope. I do have hope with when I read history, I have a little bit of hope because when I think of the American spirit, where we came from, if there's just a little bit of that left, they just need to see it rise up. Well, and, I think and the people will. And Some we can, will. We can kindle Most it. I mean, won't. you have to think about it though, too. Is that how many years did it take to get to the point of the American Revolution? How many years is of of, of abuse? Lot. How many years of oppression? How many years of hunger and of being so mistreated by your government, your own government, before people finally said, "That's enough." When it got really bad, it was about ten years. Then it was game on. Actually, the reason that it was took so long was because the state, actually, the king, parliament, backed down. The people never did. Never did. The parliament would back down. We would have had a war over the uh, stamp tax, no doubt. It was the, the people were more unified over the stamp tax than they were during the revolution. Everyone was on board. You had the farmers. They were on board. You had the elite... They were on board. The mercantile, the mercantilists, the merchants, all of them were on board with that. They were saying no. They were totally united. So what about the representation tax that we pay now? <laughs> <laughs> Ready to take one last one? We're totally one? united with that, too, because yeah. we all gladly we pay We all it. gladly pay. And we tell ourselves, well, Property we're tax, it. we're represented. Mm. I'm going to take uh, see if there's one more call left yeah. here, 458. Oh, they didn't hold, Josh. So we're, we've we are got a, just a couple minutes left here. What's our biggest action point for today? The number of things you've suggested, some books to read. Well, we always say read, 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 but I wish people would read American history. Go back and read about the stamp tax and see how people used to be. I, I honestly think we can still be that people. I really do. We're not done until we're mm-hmm. dead. At least we shouldn't be. Well, I think uh, well, I, I believe that our current system of government is dead. Oh yeah. I, I think at this point to to talk about the republic is a fallacy. It is too big. How many ten, how many minutes we got? We got uh, like a minute. You want to try this? I guess so. Four five eight. Talk the number. Good morning. Who's this? This is Ryan. Ryan, go fast. Hey, I just wanted to make the point that the people who harp on about harsher punishments are the same people who call the prisons correctional centers. <laughs> oh, nice. Good. They're usually fascist, too. Good, good point. Thanks for the call. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning. Who's this? This is Joe. Joe, go fast. Yeah, check out shatterthedarkness.net. It talks about the um, the uh, um, the secret societies infiltrating the government for the last uh, sh- uh, 70 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, this guy has studied it for 30 years, and he's uh, he's, he's uh, exposed to uh, top, top um, officials. Um. He's, he's got a, a heck of a lot of information there. It's do, you worth think, checking out. do you think the American people are done? I think that it says here that's the main uh, movement is deception. Deception and the splitting of the, of the people. Yeah, divide and, and so, conquer. Yeah, exactly. You just nailed it. Keep us in fighting. Yeah, yep, exactly. And um, that has an awful lot to do with the politics parties that we talked about in the first hour, too. Yeah. Thanks for the call. 458-TALK is the number. We've got like 30 seconds. Who's this? Carl. Uh, check out when toilet paper was invented. All right. We'll do that. Josh? I'm, I'm thankful for toilet paper. Contact myself. information? PatriotsLament.blogspot.com, PatriotsLament at gmail.com. Um, and on the oh, yeah. YouTube Radio channel? Radio Free Fairbanks. Read a book. Look up the tax stamp, or the stamp tax. The Read stamp about it. tax. All right. Have a great week. We'll see you next Saturday.